So in my um, talk last night, we were introduced to the possibility, and again, please raise your hand at any time if you cannot understand my English. Really, please do that. W last night, we were introduced to the possibility of becoming newly conscious of parts of us, parts of us, like senses of self that our mind it has been almost continually identified with. So does everybody kind of understand what I mean by that now? Angry self, worried self, anxious self, managing, controlling self. Not that any of you have any experience with those things, but <laughs> no, but do you understand what I'm saying? Happy, sense of self. All these are senses of self. In a way, this is a certain way of expressing just the, fun the fundamental Buddhist teaching that, of, you know, that there, there is no there is no unchanging self here. It feels to us like there is, but there isn't. It's just a matter of paying more attention and then our minds can begin to notice it just keeps changing. If I suddenly growled, I bet a different sense of self in you would arise. <laughs> <laughs> Not bad, huh? <laughs> I have known dogs in my life. So probably a different sense of self just emerged, right? Huh? <laughs> and with the sense of self comes a pattern of thought and feeling. So that's what I mean. Do I have to growl again? <laughs> you probably want me to. <laughs> okay, so the receptive mode of practice that we've been doing, you know, which has many different ways to connect with it. The receptive mode of practice involves finding our best access point initially to qualities of our innate nature, qualities of our fundamental awareness, like care, love, compassion, responsiveness, empathy, deep okayness, deep well-being, deep groundedness, equanimity, courage, those are qualities of our fundamental awareness. They've been impeded by our habits, deeply ingrained habits that do not seem like habits of misperceiving our whole world through the lens of this or that part of us that does not know that these are qualities available in our fundamental awareness. These parts of us do not know that. And so they keep continually trying to get these qualities you following me? They keep these parts of us, these senses of self, try to get these qualities from outside of us constantly. Okay, so that's our situation. That's one way of describing samsara. But we can begin to learn, I mean, in various ways. Obviously, what I'm teaching is not the only way, but this is one way we can actually begin to learn, and here we were using the receptive mode to help us with that, recalling a caring moment, or recalling, maybe recalling our teacher, or a, a profound mentor to us, so that when we, when we bring that person or that field of beings to mind, we can feel the power of their presence to us. It's like going for refuge in the Buddha and the realized Sangha. Or if we don't really feel much that, or don't feel connected to that way of practice, then we can think of a, caring, a simple caring moment, which we've all had many of, although we may not remember most of them because various parts of us have edited it out and make it hard for us to notice or remember them. But when invited to do so, we, we probably can remember this or that moment of caring connection which means a moment that makes us happy to recall or seems very positive or meaningful to us. Probably most of us could do that. Then some people will say, no, I just can't do that. Well, then there are other access points. Think of a place that's a very special place to you where you felt deeply well and okay. Think of a pet or an animal that you found yourself just caring about and receiving a kind of a wagging tail in response or a purr. Or if none of that seems to be very connecting, actually for almost everyone by now, something's connected, but still there might be some people who are still having trouble. 
Think of a moment when you were the caring figure for someone else. And most people by now have been able to connect to something. So that's receptive mode. And then in the very moment that we think of that and re-inhabit that, or if we think of a teacher or the Buddha, we're not trying to recall a memory of them. We're simply bringing them to mind as present to us. Or if we're thinking of a caring moment, we're remembering it, but now we try, we explore the possibility of re-inhabiting it as if it's happening now. <sighs> so sorry to do this, but I think for the larger group I need to say this, even though it's a bit weird. I mean, it might sound it, but it's just because it can really help. Then someone might say, well, I cannot envision that. I cannot bring that to mind in a way that I'm actually experiencing it as if it were happening now then I would have to say, if you're a human being, okay, I apologize for saying this, but I think it's true. If you're a human being who's matured into adulthood, you have had sexual fantasies. Okay, sorry. And what's going on in a sexual fantasy? The reason I'm bringing it up is not to be sort of something weird. It's because it's such a good example of this. In that kind of fantasizing, we are indeed bringing to mind a moment with someone that we are now re-inhabiting and getting excited about. And we're experiencing the qualities that are associated with that. Are you following me? Please don't pretend that you don't understand what I'm saying. <laughs> okay? So now we're not bringing to mind a lustful moment. That's not what we're using as a caring moment. We're bringing to mind a caring moment more like I've, had descri I've described a moment when you felt seen or um, held in care by someone, a moment, just a moment like that, that has more simplicity, equanimity, not an intense getting caught up in it. Not like that. Is that clear? But the example I gave I think could be really helpful if someone says, but I ca just can't re-inhabit any moment. No, you actually have been. So now apply that principle. Try to re-inhabit this kind of moment. Now, we were also learning, I introduced last night, that we have a capacity that we can learn to unblend from whatever part of us and f accompanying feelings and emotions. We, have an, uh, we can learn to unblend from them. That means not reject them, deny them, suppress them, avoid them, not that. It means that we can become aware of them in a way that is deeply accepting and compassionate toward that part of oneself, that sense of self that's arising and its feelings. We become, can become aware of them in a deeply accepting way that lets them have the compassionate space they need, these senses of self and feelings, to feel safe here with us. And when our minds are doing that, our minds are no longer fully identified. They're, they're no longer just caught up in because our minds are the larger awareness that is holding that part of us and its feelings in simple acceptance, gentle welcoming. Is that clear? Now, I acknowledge that's not necessarily easy just to begin doing, it requires some help and it requires repeated practice. And it requires a lot of wanting to explore in that way. If we don't want to explore in that way strongly enough, our minds simply will not. They simply will not because we don't want to enough. And our minds are too habituated, too used to just being completely sucked in to the sense of self and its feelings each moment. They're used to that. If we don't want it enough, it will not happen. And that's one way of expressing what renunciation means. Wanting to be free. Free of being sucked into and totally identified with whatever habitual sense of self occurs at the moment wanting to be free, not, not free in the sense of never having to experience any sense of self again, 
but free in the sense that we, our minds do not have to be identified with any sense of self or emotion or feeling or reaction. So senses of self, feelings, reactions will continue to come up. We're not actually eradicating them. They will continue to come up out of karmic imprint or out of intense habituation. The difference in what we're doing from just the ordinary way of being sucked into them is that we're learning closer and closer to the moment when a reaction comes up, how to be present to it in a way that is not caught up in it. When we learn that, when our minds learn that, we're starting to get free. We're beginning. So that's the notion of unblending or disidentifying by becoming aware of the sense of self and its feelings that's arising in a deeply accepting way. And as such, our minds are already no longer fully identified with it, unblended from it. Now, we're going to move into the third mode. So the first mode was receptive mode. The last part of the meditation, like in your handouts, don't need to look at them now, but in your handouts, which you should all have, meditations one and two, and we're especially focusing on meditation two now with parts language. The last part of the meditation is called releasing phase. And you remember in that phase, the mind is learning to trust these loving qualities through exposure to them. And all parts of us are learning that they can trust those qualities qualities they've been trying to get from others. And suddenly, here are these qualities that they've, that they've been trying to get. So then the parts of us can learn, you know, actually, we could relax. What we've been trying to get is already here. And then they can relax and deeply settle. And they know how to do that of themselves. So we do not try to make them do it because if we try to make them relax and settle, they will not. Then they'll be very reactive. So we bring no agenda to them other than <coughs> deeply accepting and allowing them to be here with no attempt to change them and certainly no attempt to get rid of them. If there's any attempt in the mind to get rid of them in the name of, oh yes, I'm practicing this so, so they'll relax and settle, that's why I'm doing this. So now I'm being aware in an accepting way. That's not being aware in an accepting way. And these parts of us know better than we do what we are up to. And they will really intensely grasp on because they don't feel safe with us. They know that we're seeking to get rid of them. They're like children. They show up. And you can make a, have a space of welcome, or you can say, go away. But the children cannot just go away and stay away. They have to come back to their mother. They have to. And if, you, if, we, say, if we keep just saying, go away, I want to get rid of you, they'll come back stronger and stronger and more insistently. And that's how it is with our senses of self and, the, and their emotions. It's a subtle learning. So now we're going to go, so what I was saying is the releasing phase, then the, the mind and the different parts of us can feel safe enough in the receptive mode that they begin to settle so deeply that our mind can actually begin to feel safe enough to just relax and let go of its frameworks. And that becomes the deepening mode, which is the last phase of each meditation we've done. Just let the mind fall gently, naturally open, and actually just reconnect with the basic openness or basic space that's already here. And when the mind is ready, it actually knows how to begin to do that. It can begin to settle into sh shamatha in deepening ways, deep, a deep natural calm and openness of cognizance or clarity. And things can actually settle so deeply if the mind's well prepared 
even right into the nature of mind. And that doesn't usually happen right away <laughs> for everybody or most people. It may need some help with other kinds of practice, but this is the direction. Because all pervasive openness or space and clarity and compassion energy is indeed actually our most natural state of awareness. So the mind knows how to return to its most natural state if the conditions are set for it to permit it to do so. But that's a lot of learning, a little bit of learning. So now we're going to go to the third mode. That was receptive mode and deepening mode. Is that clear enough? Third mode is called extending mode, but some have suggested to me I should call it inclusive mode. Let's see what you think. And that's when the mind is, um, that's when we're in touch with the qualities of the nature of our mind, the qualities of our basic awareness. Or if, we're, if we've really deepened you know, quite a lot, we may even have settled into our basic awareness, or nature of mind, quite a bit. Or we may even have just, re our mind may even revert to its most natural state, which is that deep nature. Any of these possibilities are there. From any of those possibilities, one way to describe it is that we're settling into or reunify, beginning to reunify with the depth of our being and its qualities of love and compassion and responsiveness and empathy, deep groundedness and equanimity, profound safeness to it. And it's from there that we can then be present to others in a way that's deeply safe also for them. It's from the depth of our being that we can, that we can start, that we can relate to others in the depth of their being, aware of their depth from our depth. So we're not operating on the level of superficial reaction from this or that part of oneself, reacting to this or that part of them, reacting to this part of me, reacting to that part of them. You know how that is at least for the moment, not operating at that level, but settled more into the depth of our being, more into the nature of our mind, or very much in that direction. Then from there, sensing others similarly in the depth of their being, in their fundamental awareness, which is actually beyond identification with any one part of them, and relating to that in them not just this or that sense of self in them that's reacting to oneself. Is that sort of clear? So that's the extending mode. Learning to hold others as we are held. Learning to love others as we are loved. Learning to know others deeply as we are known. That's the extending mode sensing others as us rather than them. Sensing others as what the philosopher Martin Buber, 20th, great, very great German 20th century philosopher, existential philosopher, relating to others in the, the terminology he used as I, thou, rather than I, it which is how we've been used to relating to each other, just as objects of need or use or reaction is the relationship of I, it, just a thing. What we're engaging is the possibility of relating to others as what Martin Buber, great Jewish philosopher, referred to as I, thou, or I, you, not I, it. And the I in I, thou, or, or I, you, is a different I. It's the depth of our being. Whereas in the relationship of I, it, you're just an object of reaction to my parts of self. The relationship of I, it, is a different I. The mind grasping to this or that sense of self in reaction to the other, reducing the other. So this is where, where I'm going to 
try to get even more precise than that. The extending mode has three key points to it that I'm going to mention now. Are you ready? Seatbelts are fastened, metaphorically. OK, many of you are nodding. So point number one, this is for extending mode. It's Thursday night, so it must be extending mode. One, when the mind is totally identified with one protective part of ourselves, one sense of self and its reactions, our perception of others is automatically reductive. And our capacities of love, care, and compassion are impeded, are partly blocked. Should I repeat that? Okay, point number one. When the mind is totally identified with one protective part of ourselves and its emotions and reactions, our perception of others is automatically reductive. And our capacities of love, care, and compassion are impeded. What do I mean by reductive? Our perception of others is automatically reductive. For example, in a moment when one's mind is totally identified with a part of oneself that is focusing on managing things, like I have until 7.15, my mind could easily identify with, perhaps it is, a, a part of me, a sense of self that is struggling and trying hard to manage this, to get it under control to get things to happen in a way that will fit into the time frame. I mean, to some degree, we have to do that. But if the mind is totally identified with that, totally caught up in that, how do all of you look to me? What do you think? My mind is totally identified with everything has to be managed and controlled. Everything, everyone. Whatever happens, need to manage it, control it. Uh, time is passing. If my mind is totally identified with that part of me and it's reacting like that, how do you all look to me? What is my perception of you from within the perspective of that part of me? How do you look to me? Any guesses? Potential people who will get you off schedule. Okay. Okay, potential obstacles, potential off-schedule troublemakers. Uh, I think it's uh, uh, maybe a simpler way, simpler way to phrase it is, uh, well, yeah, all that potentially. Maybe uh, the way I would phrase it is objects of control, objects of management. You are objects of management. And that's what Martin Buber called I it. The I is total identification with that part of oneself, that sense of self and its emotions. And the other is it, an object of need, use, reaction. You are objects of management. That's what you are to me. In the moment, any moment that my mind is totally identified with that. This, by the way, is quite relevant to people in all caring roles and professions. If a nurse walks into the room, oh, this is probably even much more typical. If a doctor walks into the room with a patient and is sort of like looking at her watch and just totally identified with that kind of part of herself, and the patient looks to her like an object of management. If the doctor walks into the room in a very different way, with a genuine curiosity, a genuine interest, care, concern, really watching, really listening. One, the, what the, patient, the patient's felt sense of that moment is entirely different. Two, it's a better doctor. It's a better doctor. Not be just because of a huggy wuggy thing I'm arguing that we should all just be very nice, not because of that, but because diagnosis involves deeply observing, deeply noticing, 
deeply paying attention. And in order for that to happen, you'd have to be really curious and interested, as if the person that you're with really mattered and is worth really paying attention to and noticing every little detail of what she is saying and how, she's, how her body is, then that's a better doctor. Anyhow, there's stories I could tell about that. When I, just after I was born, I almost died because I could not digest food, milk. So I was starving to death as an infant. And there was a famous doctor, uh, child, what do you call a child doctor? Thank you. There was a renowned pediatrician, so my mother was desperately trying to get a hold of him. He's very w he was very renowned at the time. And finally, somehow, she managed it. And then he, she said that he just spent about an hour just sitting there with me. This is one of the most important doctors in the city I lived in. He spent an hour just observing me, this baby curled up, you know, in pain sort of like agony, starving, just observe me. And then he prescribed <laughs> something. He spent an hour just paying attention, then prescribed something. And what he had prescribed solved it. But it took an hour to just pay attention. Later, my wife and I visited him when we were young adults, after he had retired, this doctor, and he remembered what that story, because he, he, he knew my family by th through that. And I asked him about that, because he's also a teacher of doctors. And he said, the key to being a good doctor, which is how I teach and train doctors, is diagnosis, which means deep attention. And he said, that's becoming a lost art. Isn't that interesting? So that's a paying attention from kind of like beyond. You're not thinking about yourself. You're paying so much attention. And that's the mind unblending from narrow senses of self that are worried about themselves. That's a, a doctor's way of unblending. That's deep. That saves lives. Anyhow, sorry, I shouldn't have gone into all that. Took up too much time. Okay, so. <laughs> Or if the mind is totally identified with a part of oneself that's angry at someone, then the other person is perceived in that moment as just worthy of anger, just bad. In that moment, we can notice that. So that's what I mean by this first principle. When the mind is totally identified with one protective part of ourselves, our perception of others is automatically reductive, and our capacities of care, compassion, love, much fuller awareness, much fuller attention are shut down. Is that clear now? Two. Principle number two, when the mind unblends from that part of oneself by holding that part in compassionate awareness, like from within the receptive mode, or even just by learning how to do that, a kind of compassionate mindfulness, if you will, whatever sense of self we're experiencing just becoming aware of it in a deeply accepting way. That could just be a mindfulness kind of practice. Or it could be receptive mode practice, which is helping us learn to do that. When the mind unblends from the part of oneself by holding that part in compassionate awareness, our perception of others starts to open. So we can sense more of their humanity and potential. Sensing them now, not just, for example, as objects of management or just bad objects of anger, but as much fuller beings, in this case, human beings who have dignity and tremendous potential and want to be well and happy just like ourselves, now we can actually uh, better perceive that. We can see more of the reality. We can see more of what's really here. Whereas before, when we were caught up in uh, s senses of self and their reactivities, we are lost from the fuller reality. We cannot know it. Our perception is closing down. We're only seeing them as objects of our reactions. You see the difference?
And with this opening of perception, as I said, our capacities of care, love, compassion, fuller awareness become much less impeded. So we can be more compassionately present and responsive to others. So that's how you could say receptive mode, deepening mode, naturally becomes extending mode. To reunify with our fuller awareness that is no not fully identified with or caught up in any one sense of self and its reactions is already to be present to others in a way that can perceive much more of what and who they are. And that's what I'm calling extending mode, present to others. Is that sort of clear? Okay. Third principle, from that fuller awareness that fuller awareness that's not caught up in this or that sense of self and its reactions. Again, not by pushing away the sense of self and its reactions, denying it, suppressing it, not by that, but how? By becoming compassionately aware of it in an accepting way. From that fuller awareness, which is now holding that part of us, Therefore, it's not identified anymore fully with that part. It's a larger awareness holding that part. From that fuller awareness, we can sense into also and uphold others in their fuller awareness, in their deep nature, in their deep potential or capacity. We can sense that in them because we are coming from that in ourselves coming from that depth in ourselves, that fuller awareness. Part of what that means in this third principle is we can sense that in others. From that depth in ourselves, we sense them more in their depth. And we cannot do that from within identification with this or that sense of self. We cannot do that. We may believe that that's a good thing to do. We may believe that we're doing it because we believe so strongly it would be a good thing to relate to others in the depth of their being. That's what a lot of religious people do. They believe in, some th in, in, in perhaps really good things. And because we believe in them so strongly, we think we're doing them. But believing in them doesn't mean that we're doing them. I believe it would be important to relate to others not just as objects, as I, it, it's important to relate to others as subjects, as I, thou, I, you. I believe in that. I'm going to argue for that. But believing that, even believing it strongly, is not doing it. In fact, it's sometimes believing in that so strongly and arguing with everybody else how they're looking at other people as I, it, treating me and others like objects. And even as we're speaking, we're seeing others as objects and we're not even conscious of it. And I don't mean to be making fun of activists in that way. I'm trying to help empower activists or help point this out so that activism, social and ecological activism can unfold. I'm not making fun of it. I'm just trying to point it out. So is that sort of clear? So we need a practice. And this is why I draw on Tibetan Buddhism. Someone was asking me, why do you draw on Tibetan Buddhism? Because it has an enormous, a, a remarkable precision and tremendous depth of experience to it that in my experience, I've never seen anything like that in the actual lived tradition of other traditions. Sorry, I, I think it may have been part of traditions and it exists in parts of those traditions, but it isn't like right in the heart and the core in a way that is so upfront as it is in Tibetan Buddhism, at least in my experience, not to mention the fact that that's the tradition I'm trained in. Uh, so that's the tradition I especially draw on to adapt these teachings. But I think the fundamental pattern is deeply shared with other traditions. As I was talking to someone just earlier, uh, at the core of Christianity is this powerful statement um, by one of the early saints of Christianity we love because first we were loved. In other words, 
that's the first letter of John. We love because first we were loved. In other words, our love is an extension of the love that holds us in love. Our love is not the attempt by an autonomous sense of self to take up a self-help technique to improve ourselves. That's not actually how it works. Is that clear? Well, that I think is the very core of Christianity, the very heart of it. And since I'm surrounded by Jesuit scholars, I feel confident in saying that. <laughs> Jesuit Christian scholars in my university. That's just an example. And I think at the very heart of Hinduism, you can find a profound devotional pattern just like this. And so also in Sufism, contemplative Islam, and on and on and on. Okay, also indigenous traditions. So now we need to enter into the extending mode meditation. And in order to do that, we're going to begin in receptive mode. So the meditation I'm leading now is Meditation four in your handout, because we're skipping one. However, you do not need to look at your handout now, but we're going to go into meditation four, because I'm sort of telling you what's already in the handout, okay? Meditation four. So what we're going to do is enter into the receptive mode that we've already been engaging, and you can do that in your, in your own best way. I gave a number of, of options. And then typically, just to lead the meditation, I just do it with two options, but you can use your own best option. Is that clear? So the two options that I tend to lead, because I have to do it with a whole large group, and then you choose your best way, but then I have to give wording. So I would suggest that if you have a real felt sense of being held in a spiritual field or refuge field or held by the communion of saints or held by God or held by the Buddha, or held by your teacher in a real power of love, compassion, discernment, wisdom. If you really have a felt sense for that, then go for it. Enter into the receptive mode that way. If that doesn't really seem deeply connecting to you at the moment, then you can bring to mind a moment of caring connection. So how do you find that? It's a moment that makes you happy to recall or seems deeply meaningful to you to recall. And then from within the receptive mode, we're going to let its flow of loving energy come through us and extend to others. So if you wish, you can think of your benefactor, whether it be a spiritual benefactor or the benefactor within your caring moment. You can think of that, that person or being behind you if you wish, or it could be alongside of you. But then the loving energy that's flowing there from this deep receptivity comes through you like a kind of radiance or flow of energy. To commune with others, starting with one person, could be one person nearby or one person that you think of, that it doesn't feel too hard to commune with, to let this flow of loving energy extend to them one person or being here in the room or that you think of and this is private you don't we don't talk about it and we certainly never talk about it with the person we thought of it's just private to learn a practice so what do i mean by communing with someone nearby or that we think of that's to sense them beyond our reductive thoughts of them in their fuller life and dignity and awareness and potential. Where communing here means a pre-verbal sense of closeness to another being. Pre-verbal, it's not even spoken. Sensing the other as a subject, a whole life and full person beyond all of my own superficial impressions and judgments possessed of great worth and potential, who wishes to be well and free of suffering just like myself. That's communing. Is that basically clear? A pre-verbal sense of closeness in that way with another as a subject, not just an object of need or use. So the sensing the other also as somewhat mysterious, 
because that other transcends all of our reductive labels that we, our minds may be used to. Oh, just an old guy. Oh, just an old woman. Oh, just one of those people. Those are reductive impressions. So sensing that there's actually a subject there, a being that transcends all those reductive impressions, that means there's a little bit of a sense of mystery to it when communing with someone else and wishing them well. Is that clear? To commune with others is to relate to them as what Martin Buber called I thou rather than I it. Okay, so it's helpful to, to, for, to, to begin the extending mode, this letting the loving energy come through, encompass that other being or person, wishing them deeply well. That's extending mode. I think it's helpful to begin that with someone else right here, or it can also be someone you think of. The reason why someone else right here can be helpful, that it doesn't feel too hard to do that with, but we keep it completely private. We don't talk about it, who it was. That helps protect the practice. The reason why I think that's helpful is because that's how the extending mode works itself out in our daily life. It's with whoever happens to be around. If you're on a bus, the other's on the bus. If you're walking to the shedra, those you're passing or walking with. If you arrive at the shedra, the person that first you first see, it's that person. So it, that's why it can be so helpful to enter into this practice right away with just someone nearby. Is that clear? That the practice is also done with whoever we think of as we familiarize with it. Some of us used to watch the evening news. I don't know what people do now. It's mainly social media or whatever it is that you guys do. But whatever it's doing, it's bringing up people to you. So then whatever people are coming up for you through social media, through anything, then the extending mode goes to that. So it's just whatever is nearby, whatever, whoever we think of. I don't share the politics of my president in the United States. So he's a good, but he keeps coming up. <laughs> it's like constantly his name comes up. So that's an opportunity. Exploring the possibility of really disagreeing with a sense of care for who I'm disagreeing with. And that's sort of an entry into a, a way of kind of social activism, which is meditation 10 in the handout. We won't have time to go into it, but I'm just uh, gesturing toward it now. Okay, so what the heck? Why not do it, right? So do you need to stretch? I have this very advanced way of stretching, you know. <laughs> it's just I have to do that for reasons that have to do with my body. You can do what works for you. You're showing me how to do it. <laughs> this is your favorite part. <laughs> Okay, so we'll do some abdominal breathing. Each inhale, your, the, our abdomens expand, the tummy expands. You should really feel it expand. Is everybody feeling it expand? Please nod yes if you are, that's important. So we're breathing into the abdomen and it expands. And then the exhale is relaxed, slow, complete, Pause at the end of the exhale. If you're familiar enough with this, boom, 
relaxation response is already happening. Sense of deep relaxation starts to kick in. And let's do it a few breaths. And now recall a caring moment and its place or setting, or you can bring to mind your spiritual benefactors. And if it's a caring moment, then re-inhabit that moment as if it's happening now. And then relax and settle into the felt sense of this caring moment, which is happening now. You are there now with that being in that way. Or that is somehow here now. And settle into the felt sense of that, what that feels like. Steeping in its loving energy and tender qualities. And just accepting them to whatever extent you can into your whole being, your whole mind and body, into all the layers of feeling as if every part of you is loved in its very being or held in care and compassion in deep acceptance. Every part of you. Just steeping in that loving energy and its qualities from within this caring moment. And if the mind gets distracted and just recall your caring moment or spiritual field and let its power pull you back into it. And now notice someone nearby you here in this room, which is an example of just someone nearby anywhere or someone that you think of with whom it's fairly easy to commune. And while continuing to be receptive to this loving energy, from within your caring moment or with your spiritual field. Still receptive to that, still kind of receiving that. And then let that energy come through you now to that person nearby or that you're thinking of. As if you are a window pane for it. Like a radiance or a gentle energy that comes through you. And sense or imagine that this energy infuses that person's whole being. And the energy is helping you to commune, commune with them in their deep dignity and worth. Just wishing them well. So instead of relating to a superficial impression of this person, we're letting this flow of energy help us sense the human being beyond our limited impressions with their whole life experience and dignity and capacity and sensing them also as like ourselves and just wanting to be well and happy and free of suffering and just wishing them deeply well. this person who transcends all my limited impressions, this deep person. And letting the energy just come through like you're a window for it.
if a part of you feels doubtful about this, then without trying to change that part of you in any way, that sense of self, just settle back into the receptive mode and become compassionately aware of that part of you in a deeply accepting way. And if it relaxes and settles, if it does, you can return to this extending mode, letting the loving energy come through you, communing and wishing well. Now let this loving energy encompass everyone here, everyone in this room, all at once. Or just imagine that that's happening. Imagine or sense a communing with them all at once. So the loving energy comes through you in a more expansive way. Helping you commune with everyone here all at once. and just wishing them all, each one, deeply well, a deep being that transcends all of our own limiting impressions, each one. Or just imagine that's happening. If you don't feel it, that's fine. And now just, this is now releasing phase into deepening mode. Just relax deeply into this felt sense of love or warmth or acceptance. This loving energy, just settle deeply into it and let that help your heart and mind to trust. Release all of its images and frameworks. And let the mind just fall gently, completely open like space. letting the patterns of experience, or thought, or feeling just unwind and release within this total openness, this basic space of awareness. The space of deep acceptance, letting everything be. So just like that, in the last part of each meditation, we return to the deepening mode. That is exploring the possibility that the mind is learning to trust enough to let go of itself more and more. We're just exploring in at the end of this meditation, what, whichever one it is, all of them in the same way. If there's a readiness in the mind to just let go even a little bit, relax its grip, 
and return to the basic space that was always already here, the basic space or openness, clarity and warmth that was always already here. And that's deepening mode. The receptive and extending modes by taking us into a fuller and fuller experience of the qualities of the nature of our mind can help the mind learn even little by little at our own pace how to begin to return to the mind's own most natural state which is all pervasive openness or space or emptiness clarity and compassionate energy is that sort of clear that's deepening mode the deepening mode is being cultivated in the last part of every meditation and in the letting be meditation I led yesterday that's just pure deepening mode <laughs> So we familiarize with this practice, those of us who take it up, after having probably for some period of time taken up the receptive mode and the deepening mode. But actually for some people it's this extending mode that's their main entry point to the whole thing. Anyhow, when we're ready to take up this practice, which is meditation number six, I think, in your handout, extending mode it'll say we familiarize with it by doing it each morning in a meditation session however brief like I when I've taught school teachers this practice typically a school teacher will say look I get up at 6 a.m. I have to be out the door at 7 a.m. I have three children so I understand that that this we can touch base with this for 10 minutes no, no, I can't. I don't have that much time. We can touch base with it for five minutes. Then if he or she says, no, I can't, now I challenge them. Oh, I bet you could get up at five or six. Why not? What's the difference? <laughs> so we familiarize with the practice by doing it every single morning, you know, like no exception. And then repeatedly reconnecting with it or the spirit or atmosphere of it throughout the entire day again and again and again and again and you're with someone or you're with others or you're noticing others or you're thinking of others and you're reconnecting with it again and again and again and again and again and again oh then I forgot about it oh but there's someone nearby and that starts to draw it out with more and more familiarity so it becomes thousands of times and that starts to retrain the brain. It actually starts, it starts to signal our brain to speak in that way for a moment, that actually this is a more normal way to be. This is actually the normal way to be. The way we've been wasn't normal. This is actually a more natural way to be. It's not some big, what difficult, we can feel that way sometimes, but it's actually helping to return us to how we're meant to be according to our fundamental innate nature even that part of our evolutionary nature which we so desperately need to hear from and by practicing like that with whoever's around us and or whoever we think of or become aware of it naturally becomes increasingly inclusive beyond in group out group boundaries but in order to continue that process of breaking through in-group, out-group boundaries, we also need help of, help of others in groups that have not been part of our in-group, which can't be, we can't just learn that fully just through meditation, personal meditation. We need to be related enough to others that we're also hearing from them how they experience things, and that will much further help. Nevertheless, this kind of a meditation practice found, builds a foundation for being able to hear more and more, receive more and more, know more, know better, know others better, know others beyond th those who are familiar to me. 
it builds the foundation for that possibility. As one's defensive reactions to being exposed to different kinds of people who think really differently and sometimes really challenge you, as one's own defensive reactions, quite natural to us, are held in awareness that's deeply accepting of them. And then our perception can open and we can receive a little more. Is that clear? Like that. So in that way, we're also becoming more aware of parts of us and how they've driven our reactions through this process. Does that make sense? And in that way, by becoming aware in that way, we're also becoming more aware of what has been driving other persons that we've disliked or disapproved of. We're starting to know them better from the inside. They also have parts of themselves and senses of self that their minds have long identified with that have been trying to protect them and drive their behavior just like me. So sometimes, and I'm sure this is true for many of you in the pra your practice of life already, that sometimes in our day, we may find when we connect with another person or being, you know, human or animal in this way, with a sense of their deep worth, sensing them as a deep being, that transcends all my limiting perceptions of them, kind of communing in that sense, and just, just kind of gently just wishing them well. We might experience uh, in a moment when that's happening that it pre-verbally invites the other person or animal to sense more in themselves, more of their own capacity than their limiting impressions of themselves, you following me? If we're present to another person or being in this way, we might notice that they're starting to sense more in themselves because we're sensing more in them than even their own this or that sense of self. Part of how we learn that is by having been around others, someone else who sees us as more than my, our, our limited thought of ourselves, sees more in us than that. And all along, whenever that's happened, and by the way, that's happening in a big way here, here at this place, here in this Shedra, that is happening. And that is pre-verbally and implicitly empowering us to learn to see similarly. That is, we're being seen in the depth of our being that's already, even without talking about it, empowering us similarly to see others in the depth of their being. Even if we don't realize that that's going on, that's another way of describing the very heart of what the Shedra is pointing to through study and practice. It's called pure perception, Dagnang in Tibetan. So I'll tell you a quick story. It's time for a story. It'll be quick, okay? We don't have much time left, so no problem. It'll be over soon. We'll be out of our misery. So. This is a true story. A Catholic theologian friend of mine was traveling with his wife, who's a Buddhist. <laughs> Sounds like a, a rabbi and a priest walk into a bar. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I get a little strange this time of night. So anyhow, this is true. So <laughs> this, this Catholic theologian, who's actually a close friend of mine, and his wife, who's also a close friend, who is Buddhist, um, so it's Paul and Kathy, you know, they, they're actually, they're, they were traveling in a taxi cab somewhere in New York City and the, the cab driver is a Haitian. Um, 
And the cab driver, somehow they got into a conversation with this cab driver, and the cab driver was telling them a true story that happened to him. He was just driving, you know, he's looking for the right address. And he was just driving through a certain neighborhood that's part of New York City, and he inadvertently ran a stop sign. You know, he's sort of like slowly going and looking at addresses, and he didn't notice the stop sign. He went right through it. And there was a man standing on the corner who became apoplectic. Does everybody know what that means? Like totally enraged. Totally enraged. Incredibly angry. And he ran at the cab and he screamed and yelled at that cab driver for having run that stop sign. I've got your attention. <laughs> so the cab driver <laughs> stopped the cab <laughs> and rolled down his window. <laughs> and the enraged man came up to the window. <laughs> and the cab driver looked at him and he said, I'm sorry, you are right, I should have stopped. And the man said, he was stunned for a moment. <laughs> and then he said, the other man, I take it all back. Do you understand? Everything I said, I take it all back. So let me analyze this <laughs> a little bit through the perspective of the training that we've been exploring. That angry man's reductive impression, reductive impression, seeing the cab driver as just an object of intense rage, just totally bad thing. That's a reductive impression reduced to just that. The angry man's reductive impression could no longer function, could not continue, because the cab driver was speaking to that man's fuller being, fuller awareness. The cab driver was speaking past the angry sense of self to a human being. Do you understand? I mean, another way to phrase this is the cab driver did not believe that the man who was attacking him was just angry thing. He spoke to the fuller being there. And when he did that, the angry sense of self could just no longer find any footing. The, what had been the angry man was being addressed too deeply the superficial reductive impressions and reactions could just no longer function and fell apart right in that moment. That was a caring moment. So the perspective of his angry self, the man's angry sense of self was released and his reductive perception of the cab driver could no longer continue. So then, having become s deeply sane in that way, helped by the cab driver, all the man could say is, I take it all back. Because now, from the perspective of his fuller awareness, more from the depth of, the, of his being which, at which he had been addressed, as if he had a depth of being, from the perspective now, from the depth of his being, for the f his fuller awareness, everything he had just said no longer made any sense at all. I take it all back. So I think I can stop there in terms of what I'm presenting. We have about 13 minutes. We'll stop at 7.15. My managing controlling part is really pleased. 
So the floor, so now it's open for questions and also observations, things that it occurs to you to share that would be meaningful that were evoked or raised up by what we've been doing or learning together, or it could also be a question, but I would invite any of that actually. So let's see, uh, Dan? Disidentifying, yeah. In a compassionate way, yeah. Uh, yes, yes, it is. Yeah. 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 Yeah, on this kind of training. But it, I guess what I would say is that ethical ways of relating to others and our world both help prepare the mind to realize there's no substantial self, to learn that it can be reunified with its fuller awareness or its most natural state or nature of mind. So acting, you know, learning to, I mean, it's a big learning for all of us. None of us are perfect, but just being aware that there are guidelines to learn to relate and then notice in our experience that when we're relating from a more caring, attentive way of relating to others, what are the results of that? And no, noticing from our own experience that when we're just relating to others from an intense identification with a, a part of us that's reacting to them and therefore can't really see them, we talked about that, and everything becomes both <laughs> unethical and really suffering. We can notice that in our own experience. That's a learning, not so like an immediate pretending that I'm a good person. Uh, all that can help prepare the mind to encounter the truth of no substantial self, of compassionately disidentifying. Compassion, as soon as we start doing that, we're already compassionately disidentifying with our perception of others as merely this or that part of them, which their mind might be identifying with. And now our way of relating to them is becoming more and more deeply ethical. And as we do that, that further empowers our practice and then from that, we're, we're, lear we're not perfect, but we're learning. And others are challenging us and causing problems and raising things. And that's becoming something that we're learning how to be compassionately aware of without having to fully identify with it. So whatever's happening, everyone's helping us. Starting to sound like Lo Jong, but that's the process. So, that whole learning process encompasses ethics, yeah. And that can become social as well as not just individual. Our approach to the whole situation in the world around us can be um, an expression of that process of learning, yeah. And I know that's what you're teaching, so. Uh, yeah. Is the ground, yeah. Yeah, that's right. And ethical conduct also helps empower our minds to further establish this ground. They're sort of feeding each other. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then in, in back, uh, Anya, yeah. Innate. Yeah, I also call it sustainable compassion training. So just those two terms. Let's talk about innate, shall we? Yeah. Yeah. Social baseline theory is also part of evolutionary psychology. Yeah. Yes. It is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No. Let's make a let's make a distinction. It can be innately available, but we need help to access it. 
something can be available, but we're not able to access it unless we have some help. And once we have that help, what the help is doing is evoking our innate capacity. And that happens relationally. It happens with our mothers or caregivers. It happens with our spiritual teachers. It happens in many little moments of care and connection. As somebody who has a very difficult childhood, it used to be thought, and, and fairly recently, I don't know if it's been maybe just 20 years or 25 years or something like that. I'm getting older, so I don't remember how many years, but it's not that many, maybe 30 years. Anyhow, it's only been so recently that it had been assumed, actually, that if you had a really difficult childhood and didn't experience uh, love or care or it was completely unreliable or you had an abusive childhood, someone was abusive to you, that sorry, that's it. The rest of your life, you're, you are caught in an attachment script or what's called an inner working model that was established in infancy and early childhood. And that's what you have for life. So then we can work with it with therapy and we can do our best, but basically it's really stuck. At just the last 30 years or so, or 25 or whatever it is, there was the discovery of neuroplasticity in adults. So you're aware of that. And that raised the question, could the brain be retrained? Could, could for example, and this is what first brought me into relation to scientists, actually was reading about what's referred to as attachment priming. There's been a tremendous amount of research with what's called attachment priming. So you take someone, no matter what their attachment orientation is, that meaning secure, insecure, avoidant. I won't go into all of these you know, technical terms, but someone that, that even has really pretty severely insecure attachment you know, really difficult childhood. And you prime them by asking them to recall actually <laughs> a caring moment or a place that feels that has felt very safe to them, or even by simply saying the word compassion or care, just saying the word. And they got, uh, measurable results that their, the person's attachment style temporarily shifted to much more secure just by that priming or an image of something that was comforting to that person. Just showing that image, then taking measures of what's called attachment style, so it, whether you, you have a sort of a sense of a core of security or at your core, you feel really hollow and insecure and really needy or other things. These are different so-called attachment styles. So even someone with a very insecure attachment style, just by doing that, priming, it's called like priming the pump, even just briefly, and it shifted that person's attachment style into secure temporarily sometimes for as long as a day or more, sometimes shorter. And it's when I read about that research, I had just been like a Buddhist studies guy. And then I was sort of working with these directions of adapting patterns of Tibetan Buddhism into these kinds of practices. And then I read about that research. I was like back in 2012, there were some new books that were published, one by Dan Goldman called Social Intelligence. Not only emotional intelligence, but I actually recommend his book, Social Intelligence, even more than emotional intelligence. He's gone way beyond that earlier book. And then I read, and he talked about attachment priming, and then I read some other things at the time. I think it was like 2011, 12. And that's what started to bring me into connection with scientists. I just said, well, wait a minute. That's what we do in refuge practice. That's what we do in Ngundro practice. Ngundro being foundational practices of Vajrayana. That's what, it's like attachment priming done hundreds of thousands of times, but all they were doing was a few times. What would happen if you did it a million times? 
So anyhow, to make a long story short, there, this, <laughs> this, in the broader world, we're starting to come into conversation with each other. So the, the leading research scientists of attachment theory, a number of them have come into conversation with the whole circle of connection of possibilities of, of compassion training adapted from Buddhism and other things. This is actually starting to become a conversation. The very people who did those attachment priming experiments are now in this conversation. It's so interesting. Anyhow, does that speak to your what your question? Yeah. If we didn't if we didn't Well, if we didn't if we didn't have an innate capacity, then it could not be brought forward in that way. And then there are a whole lot of other things. Um, I've just been reading about this, but we're sort of running out of time. But there are so many kinds of now empirical observation. Like it turns out that human children in early infancy at the stage of infancy, really very early, just a few months old or, or starting to be like a year old, are naturally uh, empathetic, uh, naturally just spontaneously. Like, you know, a research scientist is pretending to be kind of disabled and stumbling around and not able to, to get something that they're trying to hold on to. And there's a, a very young child there, like a year or a year and a half old or two years old, and the child spontaneously runs to help him. So this turns out to be true across cultures. But then as children age a little bit more, then they become, then they begin to behave differently. But still that capacity for just natural spontaneous caring is still there. It still manifests even quite a lot. But then there are also other very competing kinds of things that are becoming dominant also, like the establishment of in-group and out-group and things like that. But at an earlier stage of childhood development, they don't have a framework of in-group and out-group. That's meaningless. There's in my book, Awakening Through Love, I also tell the story of, a, of, a, of, a, of a, a, a mentally disabled child that his mother wrote about this, and then I'll just stop. It's a mentally disabled child, what we used to, we used to call retarded, that's sort of like intellectually, um, you know, disabled. And the mother was writing this letter to a literary journal that I read a lot, and she was writing about her child who was 12 years old. And she was saying that the way people think about children like mine, and then they, so many other parents and communities of mentally disabled people tell me that I should be protective of my child and not let him run to others, run towards strangers in a loving way and give them a hug and things like that because it's too dangerous. You have to stop him from doing that. And she was like this really strong voice in this letter that she wrote into this journal that that's him. She said, for example, just the other day, he, you know, Michael or whatever his name was, and I were just walking down the sidewalk. And this young man was coming toward us who was big and tattooed over his whole body and looked really mean. And he was coming right at us. And then my son, Michael, ran right up to him and hugged him. And then the young man, profoundly, respectfully, gently, you know, patted the boy and then stood to the side and let the mother and child pass. She said, if I tell Michael not to do what he does, it would be profoundly wrong. I know that, but that was an example. Okay, we have to stop. Thank you all. <laughs>